Hey, rock solid now. Good morning. Good morning. From our home here in Mission Viejo to your home, wherever you may be, we say hi, good morning. Thankful to be alive, thankful to have the hope of glory in our hearts because we know Jesus. Hopeful that even those of you who don't know him can know him and that uh, in the end, this story is going to be uh, one of a happy ending with great glory to God. So um, <clears throat> all that said this morning, uh, we're just kind of hanging out, waiting for people to show up and arrive. And uh, so how'd your week go, Kath? Well, it was a good week. I feel like I am experiencing the Lord's guidance in my life and I'm grateful for that. Awesome, awesome, that's How about cool. Yours? Um, I would say um, I, I am very grateful for this week. Many, many different experiences with the Lord and, and uh, successes, failures, uh, abundant life in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm very, very happy to be alive and happy to be headed toward the promised land. And uh, thankful that I have a lot of friends joining me. So. I, I just, one more note on asking each other about our week and, and saying something about it. I'm so grateful to the Lord that He cares about our moments and that we have so many of them and they aren't all uh, fairy tale-ish, if any, and, and yet that He sees us through. So it isn't just about a pat answer of, oh, the Lord is good, but being able to live through the moments of our lives seeking Him and He wants to be found. Yeah, right on. So um, uh, greetings from this side of the uh, crisis of COVID for the last few years. And uh, I hope you're emerging out into uh, the new world, the new life in a good, positive way. Uh, our studies are oriented toward helping you to know how to think and how to live and uh, how to please God in a, in a new era and uh, not, not to try to return back to the old era like Lot's wife did. Remember Jesus uh, talked about uh, going forward, you know, put your hand to the plow and keep going forward. And uh, now we're in a, in a new era, uh, a new uh, place and a new space. And, and some of us are still kind of isolating because of the, the, uh, the lingering threats around us and that's okay. There's still time to learn all of our lessons and, and uh, get ready to move forward. And others of you are way out there exposed to all the new dangers of life. <laughs> and, uh, so together um, as a community of faith, we'll face these things together, pray for each other, mm -hmm. keep fellowshipping on Monday and Tuesday nights, men's and women's groups, sharing our ordeal and dilemma and prayers with each other and uh, getting a little midweek Bible study in with Dave Woods on Thursday evening at 6.30, and then returning to God uh, uh, of our blessings as we uh, give and contribute. Zoe Church uh, has a website, uh, zoechurch.com, where there's a PayPal button, or you can do Zelle, zelle at zoechurch.com, email contribute, and uh, just just uh, return to the Lord blessings, material blessings, and uh, as He um, as He has all blessed us all so much, and we have so much to be grateful for. So that's about it, except to tell you that uh, you can go to our YouTube channel, uh, Zoe Church, and uh, find the messages from what we've been going through for the last year, almost uh, a couple of years now, and uh, they're categorized in playlists so you can uh, catch up on things or review things as as you uh, as you see fit so um, uh, that's it let's get this uh, uh, service underway and I'm going to ask Kathy to open us with a prayer please pray with me Lord this is this is yours we are yours this time is yours it isn't uh, just an exercise it's it's a time of us seeking you and wanting to find you. And so we're opening this service in prayer, coming to you, Lord God, and wanting to, um, wanting to pray the prayers you want to answer. 
So please, uh, please guide in this mm-hmm. in this time, Lord, and in, in all the ways, not just for me asking, but for us agreeing, for all of us uh, joining in to just want Your will in our lives, Lord. I thank You so much that worship is so much more than singing a song that we are your worth vessels we are your worth ships um, your vessels that you're pouring yourself into us you've already done everything to make us successful and yet you're here with us wanting to lead us be beside us and follow after us um, as you help uh, just shepherd us into that next life with you where everything is tearless and joyful always. So Lord, we pray for today that you would help us to lay down what we need to, to let go, if even just for a while, that we could not only surrender to you, but acknowledge you and believe that you are good and you are doing good in our lives. And then it's filtered through these human beings that you've made into a world that you care about and i pray that we would not forget that that you so loved the world heavenly father that you gave jesus and jesus willingly gave himself so lord now we give ourselves this time over to you to be able to hear and receive i pray you'd help us to be able to do that and that we could apply your word into our real lives in jesus name amen amen Amen. Thank you, Kathy. Another great prayer. And uh, let me just do my usual reorientation here. Uh, take center screen, get a little bit of focus going, and, uh, and then get us rolling. We have a scripture for this morning. It is, in, um, it is in Philippians, and it is chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Uh, so we read there in the scripture, this is Paul the Apostle writing, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. So um, let's have one more prayer. Father, help us with your scripture. Help us this morning to uh, just soak this in. I pray that along with uh, living in a new era, uh, a new post-COVID pseudo-modern era, that we might be able to uh, live in in a new way, understanding you. I pray our hearts and minds could be opened up again to learning from you and of you. And I pray that you would give us those soft hearts where we're teachable, those, uh, those, those minds where we're, we're open and not fearful of everything. We're not reactionary, but we are thoughtful and we have thoughts going on that, that uh, are some inspired by you and somewhat directed by you and somewhat, uh, and some of them end up Uh, oriented toward you. And I pray that on all these ways, Lord, you would bless the days to come, but especially this morning of your time in Scripture. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, let's let's talk a little bit of uh, uh, four corners here. Uh, When I say four corners, what do you think of? There's north, east, south, and west. Uh, There's news. (laughs) Northeast, south, and west, get it? So um, it's actually west and south creates news, right? Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm waiting for Kathy to get it, because if, if Kathy doesn't get it, you're not going to get it either. Okay, so it's, it's here on earth. The Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, this phrase is found in Scripture, the four corners of the earth. It literally means all of the earth. The, everything that can be experienced uh, anywhere on earth is, is found within the four corners of the earth. So um, you have an earthly existence and that earthly existence now has four, it has four corners, if you will. 
Uh, call it four dimensions. That's kind of confusing. We'll just call it four corners. But um, it's your place in this world. And, and, uh, and so you have a place as a human being. Uh, you are a part of the human race. That's, that's corner number one. Uh, corner number two, uh, you are in a community of faith this morning. If you're listening to this or listening to a replay, now, you may not be a regular member. You may not be all in. You may have your toe in the water, whatever. Uh, but, but still, you're participating. You're looking in on a community of faith. And, and in that sense, this morning, you're sharing in that. Uh, those of us who follow Jesus see the value of being totally involved in a community of faith because it is an opportunity for us to experience more and more the presence of the Lord because two or more are gathered. He's there in our midst and we have this shared experience of going through life together in a community of faith. So that's your, your second corner is your place in a community of faith. Um, and then <clears throat> your third uh, corner of this world is, is your work. Uh, and now your work is composed of a, of, of a location, your workplace, and maybe that's home. Maybe you're working a lot from home. Uh, or maybe you're not working, maybe you're in between jobs, uh, but, but you're still in between jobs. I mean, that's your, that's your work status. Uh, maybe you're never going to work again, okay? So that's still a work status there. And then there, there are your skills that you use at work, that you've, that you've learned, that, you refi that you've refined, that you are hired for, that you are serving in a, an organization for. So uh, that, that third corner is your work. And then your fourth corner is your home. And you probably are not homeless. Even homeless people usually have a bridge they live under or territory that they have. Uh, most of them don't have internet connection, so they probably aren't watching this morning. But, but uh, be it ever so humble, you have a home. And that's, that includes a location, but it also includes a family, if there's others there with you, if you're not living alone. Uh, and you have uh, immediate, uh, immediate others, and you have uh, significant others there under your roof. So those are your four corners. Uh, your, your place in the world, your place in the community of faith, uh, your, your place in, at work, and your place at home. So, um, so in our examination of Philippians, we are going to see that salvation affects all four realms of existence or all four corners of the earth in your life. Now, you can block it from affecting anything in your life. You can be totally out of balance, totally into home, totally into the workplace, totally into um, social cause in this world, uh, and, uh, and, or totally into the church bubble. You can be uh, out of balance in some area and just have your primary existence in another. But you are still um, uh, participating in those realms, and salvation wants to bring all of those realms into focus for you and make you a participant in all of those realms in a way that's both pure and blameless. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this morning we are at the uh, key section in the start of Philippians, verses 3 through 11, and it began with thinking and thanking. Uh, remember uh, that uh, opposite thinking and thanking in verse 3 are the alternatives of reacting and shamefulness later. Uh, that when questionable conflicts uh, arise in relationship or, or when issues arise in relationships, it's better for us to think instead of react. And later on, the, that thinking will lead us to thanking that we, were th that we thought about it. QRST. Remember? Uh, that's how we started this section. So while the section started with thinking and thanking, today it ends with progress and praise. That uh, the section is obviously filled with prayers all along the way. There are prayers and it's dependent upon agape love, that special kind of unconditional love that comes from heaven above. But uh, the, the progress and praise are the result of agape's love effect 
on the mind and heart of all of us. So let's put this together today and, uh, and see if we can round out this, this major uh, section which introduces the book of Philippians to us. So <clears throat> let's turn back on our location services for where we're at in the text this morning. Okay, we're in the early 60s, okay, not the 1960s of Neil Young or Joni Mitchell, but the first century 60s of Caesar Nero and Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ. We are reading the first of four letters written by that same Paul while he's under house arrest in Rome, where that same emperor Nero is the Caesar, and the emperor, and Paul is awaiting his appeal to Caesar, waiting for the judgment to come down that has actually got him transportation to Rome, uh, albeit under the guise of, of guards and chains and, and uh, incarceration, he still uh, has gotten to Rome this way. And the chronological place in history that we are at is fixed just after the events described in Acts chapter 28, after the end of the book of Acts, in other words, immediately after that historical recollection of the progress and development of the Holy Spirit's introduction of faith to the world. Okay, so this <clears throat> letter to the Philippians is the first of the so-called prison epistles, and it was written to acknowledge the receipt of uh, no strings attached gift that that financed Paul's house arrest in Rome. That was carefully described in Philippians 4, 10 through 20, and it's alluded to throughout this letter. So the other um, thing that we want to note this morning to help us fix our context is that <clears throat> Paul has, as along with acknowledging the receipt of the gift with no strings attached and explaining the terms of it, now he wants to minister help to the Philippians so that they can make progress in the faith 10 years after they first received the gospel through Paul. So there are, there are places to go, people to see. There are things to happen in the faith. They need progress in the faith. We're going to talk about the essential um, need for progress in faith uh, a little bit later this morning. But, but that's the purpose of what Paul wants to accomplish by writing all of this. So he didn't just send a note, say, hey, I got the money, I, I receive your, your uh, gift to the Lord, I receive it in pure heart, in a pure way, you gave to the Lord, you believe, you gave in faith, you're responding to the gospel, I'm going to uh, use my financing of house arrest here to further spread the gospel, sets the proper terms up. He's not in Rome to represent Philippi or even uh, some organized institution that's forming. He's, he's there free and clear to, to preach the gospel, to teach the gospel, to see where the gospel goes next to the Gentiles. But along with that, Paul's going to return to the Philippians a blessing. And that blessing is he's going to minister to them and he's going to minister uh, through words. So our scripture this morning, verses 9 through 11, finishes that section 3 through 11 that establishes the scope of the entire letter. This is a lot like we saw in uh, 1 Thessalonians. Remember we saw that section in chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, but basically 9 and 10, which gave us that fourfold scope of the entire letter. Remember, the gospel comes in, it converts, it focuses, and it rescues. We saw that spelled out in that section, and then the whole rest of the letter to the first Thessalonians expanded different facets of that in a very, very uh, beautiful way. Uh, so, so that section then became a guiding uh, uh, section. That's what this section of Philippians does for Philippians. It, it functions to open and expand all the horizons that are going to be addressed and talked about. And, and so we are now um, in the last part of, of that section. And, uh, and, it, and so far in this section, we've seen that uh, 10 years of praying for the Philippians' needs has resulted in Paul being thankful and joyful uh, when he thinks about them. When he thinks about them, he's thankful. When he goes to pray for them, he's joyful. 
he's praying has become a habit. Praying for them has become a habit. And so uh, the persistence in prayer, we noted that in verse three or in verse four, excuse me, the prayers that he offers uh, whenever I pray, verse four, they are deasis, the ongoing needs. Whenever he included the Philippians in prayer or he heard about them and made a mental note to pray for them and then he went to pray, uh, it was for their needs. They needed things. And so he would pray for those ongoing needs. Uh, everyone should have someone praying for your ongoing needs. That's one of the things you get with a community of faith by being committed to one. You get people who are going to, they're going to pray for your needs. They're going to make notes when you say something. They're going to pray for what you ask for, probably, unless you're asking for something they know is not good for you. Uh, uh, but all judgments aside, uh, sometimes even praying beyond what you ask for and need uh, for for seeing things that you really need. And so, um, uh, so um, Paul did that for 10 years. And, uh, and, and uh, his thoughts, as we mentioned, uh, well, now were ones of thankfulness instead of, um, instead of shame. When he prays, he has joy. And then we also saw earlier in verse 6 that it's God who works in the Philippians and he con he'll continue to work until his work is finished. Uh, and that finished work is the return of Christ. So that's the scope of of the, uh, of the work of God in their life. Paul doesn't write back 10 years later and go, oh man, you guys in Philippi of Macedonia, you guys are so awesome. You've established so much what it means to be uh, a Christian. You need to uh, build a, a, an institution there and pass this on to the next generation. Paul views this as uh, um, Philippians. You got a long way to go to the second coming of Christ Let's get going with it. Let's keep going with it. Uh, because if you let up, uh, you are going to let up on, on God's work. And God's not going to let up. He's going to keep trying to work on you. So uh, we have there this acknowledgement. We also have acknowledgement of grace, both in Paul's life and in the Philippians' life in verse 7. They share with Paul the special favor of God. They've shared uh, the blessing to be able to um, to be able to provide for his house arrest, they shared in that and and graciously gave for that, and Paul has graciously uh, served the gospel when he used to um, torment it, when he used to chase it down and and try to stop it. So so grace is abounding, and and that's mentioned. So now, verse nine comes and it balances. This section started in verse 3. So in verse 3 and verse 3 and 4, whenever I pray for your needs, now is balanced by verse 9, uh, I now pray. Now I'm praying for this, a present tense uh, verb. Not whenever I've prayed in the past, the last 10 years, but now this is what I'm praying for you for. This is where uh, when I go and talk with God, with my uh, connections with him, which are deep and strong and intimate. These are the things I'm praying for. I'm letting you know this so that when you see God do this, you know that he's answering prayers and you're to go along with this. You're to make this a part of that experience you have with him. Now I'm praying for this. And so, um, and so he reveals to them what really matters. And I hope you can see the importance of this phrase. It's in the important section of, um, of Philippians. This is not something Paul is going to build up to later. Uh, this is revealed at first so that the full grasp of it can be taken on throughout the letter. And we will do that. We'll keep coming back to explain uh, how things in the letter are related to what really matters. And what really matters here is that you prove to be pure and live blameless lives full of Christ's fruit, which are character and deeds. So that's what really matters. Not, it's not how much you gave to support Paul. It's not how, how uh, expansive Christianity is becoming. It's not how um, uh, uh, victorious 
The cross seems to be. So what really matters and what Paul is praying for now for the Philippians is that they, that they are able to prove to live pure and blameless lives full of Christ's fruit, which are character and deeds. And it is specifically in the day of Christ's return. So I hope you can see that, that, that the day of Christ's return is future. That's a good thing for them because they're not fully uh, pure and blameless. They are, they are to become that. They are to keep moving forward in that. But, uh, but it also is, is coming, coming forward. Uh, it is in the future, and it is something that they are progressing toward. They're not just static, waiting for this. So there, there, is, um, there is this twofold um, call to live uh, pure and blameless lives. The word pure here is the word that means uh, judged by sunlight. Uh, now you can look at this in a lot of ways. If you have an area of your yard in the winter time that has mildew, when the sunlight starts hitting it again, the sunlight will, will basically bleach it and purify that, will, will remove the contaminants of it. Uh, we use this as a, as a metaphorical phrase in our culture. Sunlight is a great cleanser. In other words, if you look at something and look at the truth of something, then that which is corrupt in it tends to be excoriated, tends to be expunged. And so, um, and, and so uh, living a life that's judged by sunlight uh, is, is to live a pure life. Now, I want to contend with you that this is more than just something that's vague and idealistic. I think there are real ways in this uh, pseudo, let me make sure the quote marks get in the screen, the pseudo modern world. There are ways in which uh, you can judge your life by sunlight. So I mentioned before the four corners, okay? You may have corners of your tent, if I can use mixed metaphors there, you may have corners that you don't, you don't go near, or you don't uh, care about, you never pound the peg down again, make sure the tent is secure, you just uh, you know, avoid that or whatever. You may be out of balance and, and only live in one of the four corners. That's, that's okay, that's between you and the Lord. I'm gonna address all of them right now. There is a way in which you can be judged by sunlight in being a human being in this world. And that is, be a decent human being. Don't be a jerk, to say it in the negative. You are called by God to live with respect for other human beings, to live with respect to all lost and saved. You are part of a human uh, family of people and you are, uh, you are not going to be okay with God if you do not respect others and you act like, uh, you act like a jerk, okay? You might justify your actions. You might have reasons why you act like you act, but abandon them if they're not, if they're not making you a decent human being. Just give them up because they're not worth you uh, having to give account for them. You are called to be a decent human being, okay? If you fly off the handle and get mad at somebody, repent of that. Try to understand, why do I do that? Why did I do that? And change your behavior. Become a decent human being. Become the kind of person that people want to be around. Become the kind of person wh who's full of grace, who's got graciousness about them. So um, that's how you uh, live in the sunlight in this world. Uh, and then uh, in, in terms of in the church, in the community of faith, you can be judged by sunlight by serving others, taking your place among others. So many people today want to be a loner. They want to be right. They want to be, uh, they want to be connected with the authentic faith. And that's to the demise of all others. They won't be a part of a community of imperfect people who are together walking in faith, uh, abandon that, abandon that ship. That ship will sink one day. Uh, you, will, you can pretend and have all the words that you were there uh, uh, in faith, but all you're there is to use others and to use the place that you're given uh, to further your own ends, give that up. 
So to live in the sunlight in a community of faith is to serve others in it. And, you know, I realize this is a difficult time for us uh, because we don't have a particular location in a building. We're meeting over this Internet, uh, but we're connected in the spirit, in the spirit of God. And there are ways where you can use that to your own advantages. You, you can gossip. You can gossip about people in your in your community of faith. You can destroy them with words. You can resist their uh, their, their need for your prayers, for your involvement in their life. Uh, you can uh, be less of, of, a, of a person judged by sunlight if you want to with respect to your community of faith. Or you can be more. If you can, attend uh, the men's and women's group, uh, listen in on the, on the uh, uh, midweek Bible study, be faithful to and diligent to listen to what we're doing here on Sunday morning and try and get at least one or two things that you carry out of this that you can think about and apply in your life each week. Uh, you can be someone who serves others by, by having that shared experience. And, uh, and, and so in that way, your life can be pure, judged by sunlight with respect to the community of faith. Okay, now here's where it gets uh, even more interesting uh, in, in, in the workplace. You can be someone who's judged by sunlight uh, on the job, in the workplace, whether that's your home or you go to a building. And the way you do that is by working hard, by being serious about your work. Don't take advantage of, of uh, opportunities you might have to, to exploit that work, but be a serious person at work. Develop skills for work, apply those skills, refine those skills, make those skills more and more a part of, of your life. Uh, allow your personage to develop, to include those skills, to, to make you a valuable asset in the workplace, on the job. That's how you can live a pure, purer life in the workplace, that corner of your place on earth. And again, there are special uh, caveats. If you're in between jobs, uh, you can still be developing uh, skills, or, or maybe uh, you're in an arrangement where uh, your part of the workplace is to support and serve someone who's going out to a workplace. Uh, it's, it's the same thing. You're, you are providing uh, that seriousness, that hard work that, that goes along with working. That's a place in the world that you share with all the inhabitants of the, of the earth who can. Uh, work, work hard, uh, labor under the curse that's on the earth, and do it uh, in such a way that you are a testimony to God's one day lifting that curse and annihilating that curse. But don't be uh, foolish about this. Let your life be judged by sunlight. Let your work be exposed to the questions. Are you serious about it? Are you developing your personage around it? Do you have skills that you're increasing and you care about? Are you serving with those skills others? And then finally, and probably, and notice we're getting more and more uh, uh, deeper into uh, what I would say uh, this, this um, reality check, uh, your home. Uh, in your home, don't, don't allow it to be free from being exposed to sunlight. And the way you do that is by being an honest and a more honest person. You live around people who are seeing you honestly. You must have feedback from them. You must not try to deceive them. You must uh, be open with their involvement in your life. And you must be serving them so that they feel the, uh, the common goal service. And this begins to impinge even on the way we think about uh, those who we care about most, how we think and act about them. That's how our lives are judged by sunlight. They become pure. We allow our place in the world, our place in the community of faith, our place on the job, and our place at home we allow those things to purify our lives by being honest. Now, you say, well, how does this work? I mean, 
We live in this uh, pseudo-modern age where I can go uh, look at satellite pictures of troops uh, compiling on the border of the Ukraine, and, and I look like a, I can see things that a government official only would see in previous times. And how do I, how, how, am, I, um, how am I to handle all of this virtual uh, travel and I, it seems like I, uh, my places in the world are unlimited. I can, I can see a camera on Mars and look at the Martian landscape. Well, you don't live on Mars and you're not fighting in the Ukraine, okay? So you can be honest about it. Uh, you can take an interest in things that are happening. You can be uh, all for exploration of planets, but uh, you better not be putting on your little Martian hat in the morning and thinking you're walking on Mars because you're not, even if you can see it on your screen. Uh, you better not take your uh, gun out to the range and pretend like you're shooting uh, Ukrainian or Russian soldiers because you're not. Uh, and, and, uh, and so you let the reality that you live in check your thought world and your virtual existence. And this applies both to your community of faith, your workplace, and your home. So that's how you live a pure life. Now, blameless lives uh, is the absence of corruption. And we just made the transition to the absence of corruption. So if I'm living a blameless life in this world, I am not pretending to live somewhere where I don't. I'm not pretending to have some type of connection with a place that I don't. I am connected to the Ukraine because I can see it. I am connected to Mars because I can see it via video. But that's the extent of my connection. And, and so uh, I'm, I'm blameless uh, if I limit it to that. I'm not blameless if I suddenly start living out some fake scenario where, where I pretend that I'm somehow there or more important to that. Now extend this also to the community of faith, okay? I am a part of a community of faith Believers, I have, uh, I have a role. I pray about the things that I contribute. I serve others. My particular place is to serve. One of the ways I serve is in teaching. And so, uh, and, and so I don't pretend to be an apostle. I don't pretend to be more than I am. But I don't shirk the responsibility uh, of being a teacher. I, I'm, I'm not trying to be a stand-up comedian or, or an entertainer. Okay, I'm trying to teach uh, the Word of God. That's my reality check. If I teach something that's absurd, it should check my reality and I should get that blame out of my teaching because I will be blamed for teaching something uh, that's, that's not right, okay? Remember, James says, the old King James says, be not many masters for you know they receive a greater condemnation. Those are teachers. Uh, don't be a lot of teachers. Don't everybody aspire to be a teacher because they receive a greater condemnation. If they teach something that's wrong, they'll be held re accountable for that, and responsible for that. So whatever your particular uh, way in which you're serving in the community of faith, are you praying for others? Are you loving others? Are you staying connected to others? Are you there for others in practical phileo ways? Uh, in all of those ways, there is a corrupt way to do it, to serve yourself. And there's a blameless way to do it, to do it uh, with that uh, pure service in mind. And, and so what Paul is, is saying here in, in these verses 9 through 11 is that there's, there is something which is going to get you to what really matters. And that something uh, is uh, you know, the means to an end is that your love needs to abound more and more. Let me, uh, let me go through this a little carefully. He doesn't say your love of God. He doesn't say your love of each other. He doesn't qualify your love. It's your agape, your love. And your agape love, which is that unconditional love that we only know about from God, that Jesus so carefully expounded upon in the upper room in the last... Uh, uh, in the last um, uh, training camp that he put on, that, that agape love is that special kind of love that's, that's uh, uh, unconditional, it's not self-centered, it's, self, it's serving and not serving self, it's serving others. That love needs to abound more and more in your life. So, so the fact that it's not um, objectified here means that 
all the realms of agape are implied. God is the source. He's the one who gives us agape love. And it's him who deserves agape love. We need to love him because he's worthy of love. As Kathy prayed this morning, he's just, uh, we're just vessels of his worship. He's worthy of love, so we need to praise and, and honor him for that. But we also love one another that way. We serve one another in love, and we love the unlovely. We love those that are, that are excluded outside of our own perceptions of what we love. The conditions we put on people are not there uh, in, the, in uh, some people, and we need to love them also. And so what Paul prays here, what he tells the Philippians he's praying for, is you're going to be hit with the, the uh, calling to love more and more, to abound more and more in love. And this is going to do something to you that's going to alter your existence. And the way it's going to alter your existence is through knowing and perception. And he, again, he doesn't say what you're going to know, and he doesn't say what you're going to perceive. And so the implication is everything you know and all that you perceive are going to be affected by this abundance of love that you're called to. And here's where we don't want to get in uh, to the doorway this way. We want to go another route. We want it explained to us so that we understand it in that Aristotelian way. Understanding is true wisdom. And then when we understand something, we can do it, like fixing your plumbing or fixing your toilet. Uh, and, and that's the way we want to do things. And what Paul is saying to the Philippians here is, you're going to be able to have pure and blameless lives going into it the other way by loving. By, by being a loving person, you're suddenly going to know what it means to be loving toward someone, loving toward someone else, loving toward the unlovely, loving toward God, loving God, being loved by God. The abundance of agape will make that in your mind clearer and you will not get clarity until you do it. Okay, I don't know if I'm being clear here today. You're not going to think your way through this. But when you do it, it's going to make you think. It's going to make you think more and more. You're going to be a more thoughtful person. So let me say it another way. If this morning you go, hey, I'm all into being pure and being blameless. So uh, I'm just going to be a more thoughtful person. I'm going to think more. Uh, you're probably going to just grind your gears for a while. The material you're going to have is schadenfreude. The material you're going to have, doom scrolling. You're going to have thoughts that are going to just pelt you right and left. And that kind of thinking is not going to help you live a pure life or a blameless life. On the other hand, if you say, so this God who called me to know him is working inside of me and he's going to call me to agape, uh, in, in some way, where is he calling me to agape? And you ask that question and you see it and you live it, uh, both in character and in deeds. Uh, the character comes from Jesus and the deeds are the works of Christ. Then what's going to happen is your thinking is going to open up. Your mind is going to open up. Of course, I see this now. And, and almost as importantly, your heart, your perception is going to open up. I perceive new things. Uh, this world in which we live in uh, today has got remnants of an old world which ought to be more and more obvious to you than ever before. Uh, there, are, there are things that are people are just nakedly uh, 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 corrupt today. And, and they don't even know it. They, they don't even know how exposed they are because of where we've come as a people in history, things that have happened. Uh, and, and, and those who have been hiding from this agape, those who have been serving themselves are, are being more and more exposed. It's just serving self. All they're doing is enhancing their own, uh, uh, their own brand, their own, their own productivity. Let me, um, let me transition here to a general statement about what salvation is. Salvation is a work of God that has three facets to it. Yeah, it's Father, Son, and Spirit. But, uh, but specifically, 
Salvation is an accomplished fact, but it also is experiencing the continuing rescue in the presence, and it is a consummation of that rescue in the future. We saw this in Thessalonians. We're going to see it again in Philippians because it's the same author. It's the same God working the same salvation. But, but there are three things going on at once. Now, they are not reducible, okay? Uh, those of you who, who take notes, uh, put this in the note panel so that when you go back over this in three years, you'll realize, hey, that was something that was pretty cool to think about. Okay, so to be, to be reducible... The theologians have turned this into phrases, okay? And this is what you don't want to do, okay? So, so uh, the accomplished fact then becomes justification. The experience of, of, of continuing in the present becomes sanctification. And the consummation in the present becomes glorification. And that's what the theologians do. And then they break off and they stratify all of those concepts. And, and your mind just gets to the point where it just goes, eventually. Uh, and if it doesn't, uh, see me, I'll give you a rating, uh, reading list and it'll blow your mind up. Uh, but but that's, that's not valuable. It's not useless. Um, let me ask you a question. When you see the fossil record, when you see something in the fossil record, what does that tell you about life? Okay, and I emphasize life too much because you probably got it. It doesn't tell you much about life, okay? You may see a little baby uh, raptor uh, before it's born, uh, and, and you may understand something about eons and eons ago dinosaurs existed, and then there was this Cretaceous uh, level of uh, iridium in, in the uh, fossil record, and there maybe was an explosion that eliminated the dinosaurs and the Ice Age. You may have all these ideas about uh, the fossil record, but it doesn't tell you much. Well, what about this fossil? A man in Pompeii was sitting at dinner when lava encased him, and he still got the food in his mouth, okay? There's another fossil uh, image for you, but it doesn't tell you much about life. It doesn't tell you whether he liked the meal he was eating, whether it was made by him or somebody else. It, it just is limited. That's what theology is to you. It's a fossil record. It's breaking up everything into component parts to, to try and see it. And what God is doing in our life is not reducible to that. It wasn't reducible to the Philippians. It's not reducible to the Thessalonians. It's not reducible to you and I. Because He has justified us if He's called us to Christ. If we've responded, we're the chosen people. But we're justified every time we believe Him. He, he gives us justification for believing Him. And we need that daily. It's, it's almost as if you, could, if you confuse these things and stratify them, you're going to become part of that fossil record. You're going to become a, a phase in theology that, oh, well, they were justified, but they weren't sanctified. And uh, boy, we got a whole lot of qualified uh, fossils around who are uh, fossils of another era of Christianity walking around. Paul doesn't want the Philippians to stop. They must go forward. They must progress in their faith. They must go forward. And, and so the progress which he calls for is for them to continue on with what he said in verse 6, the work of the Lord in their life. Now God is eternal. He's outside of space and time. So when he works on us in the four corners, he does eternal things in our life now. That's why you can't just reduce this to future because part of the future is here in the present and part of the present is about the past, but they're all three together in you as a person. And that's where you need to thrive. You need to be there present uh, with a history of redemption, with a history of justification, and you need to be mindful of a place that's coming where, where God will finish the work He started, and He is trying to do that now, and you can't step out of that and examine it separately. You've got to be fully engaged in all of it. And so progress, which is, which is started and will be completed, is underway, 
And the Bible is full of metaphors, uh, living metaphors, agriculture, athletics, travel. It's full of structural metaphors, building and uh, architecture. Uh, but the point is, is that what God has started, he's going to finish and he's working on it now. So get used to making progress. And if you stop making progress, you're an alumni maybe of Christ, but you're not a follower of Christ. You're not being rescued from this present world. You're going to become part of the fossil record of this present world. So there are basically four types of progress. Uh, we're familiar with them in some ways. Numerical progress, intellectual progress, moral progress, and social progress. We're familiar with numerical and social progress because that's all that evangelicalism in the old fossil world was concerned with. Numbers and social gains, social culture wars. That was all they were focused on. And, uh, and so as that tide goes out and that, uh, that those efforts are, are immortalized in the fossil record, uh, we need to be moving on with intellectual and moral progress in our life. Paul is talking about intellectual progress in verses 3 through 11 in Philippians. You are to be a thinking person, but you are to be thinking about the way in which God has called you to love. Love somebody, love others, love God. And as you do it, your thoughts will open up about this world, will open up about them, will open up about you. You'll be able to think more. You'll be a more thoughtful person. And, and, Believers have to grow both individually and as a community of faith in our understanding of the truth. This is the only way we can do it, by loving more and more and then understanding that in, our, in the way we were living, there was a lot of blindness and a lot of futility. And this is true of any age. It's not just post-evangelicalism. Any age that we're in, to make progress is to see the blindness and the futility of the past era and to have a new life that constantly renews our mind and our intellect. We must have an intellectually pure, fresh, and engaged existence in this life or the work of God is going to be lost in us. We won't see it. We won't participate in it. And then we must make moral progress because salvation is about deliverance from sin okay so jesus is obedient to the gospel he's obedient to his father's words the words he revealed to us and we must reproduce that as his followers we must also be obedient and that's where we make moral progress not in demanding of others moral behavior that's not moral progress moral progress is when we ourselves are obedient more obedient to god than we than we were before a growing obedience to god a growing place in this world where we understand what what is reproduced in us which jesus had in its fullness that is total obedience to his father in heaven Okay, so this is a lot of stuff uh, we've gone through this morning. It's a lot of stuff for these verses. I commend to you uh, verses 9 through 11. Uh, and I want, to, I want to just really hit those four corners again to let you know that to live a pure and blameless life, be a decent human being. Don't be a jerk. Don't let anybody tell you that being a jerk is effective. Reject that. That's nonsense. That's not God honoring. Don't be a jerk. Understand what's acceptable and not acceptable in human relationships and don't be unacceptable. Okay, this isn't about uh, some uh, political or social agenda. This is about you as a human being that others can and want to be around uh, in their best way. Secondly, okay, don't be a loner. Be a part of a community of faith. And what I, what I mean by that is be fully a part. Serve others in that community of faith. Don't go there to, to find a family, to find a, a testimony, to find a witness, to have your needs met and served by others. Don't be a part of a community of faith to get that. 
be a part of a community of faith to give that to others so that others can have that, so that others can know the joys of that, so that others can, can see the, uh, the value of persisting in your faith, of calling on God. Be a part of a community of faith for your own sake because it knocks off those edges of selfishness. You will not serve yourself in a community of faith forever. You will be uh, at odds with and at loggerheads with others in that community of faith the more you serve yourself. Let the Lord knock those things off of you. As, as iron sharpens irons, as rocks in a tumbler, when we're a part of each other's lives, those edges get knocked off of us. And that's very, very healthy and important for your progress in the faith. Thirdly, in the workplace, work hard. Be a serious person on the job. It doesn't mean you have to be intense all the time, but it means you need to be serious. You need to be diligent and skillful and, and uh, refine those skills, make them better, become more valuable in the workplace. But understand that, that in the workplace, you are connected to others in a very uh, uh, healthy way if you have purity and blamelessness and you are moving toward that and growing in that. And then probably the most important, but, but needs to be balanced, is at home. Honest and truthful, in, even in the inward parts. Those people who are your significant others, who you live with nearby, they see you. They know you. You, you are going to have a hard time pulling a fast one on them by telling them you're someone you're not. But on the other hand, they're probably accepting of you as you are and would really celebrate with you the growth that you are going to have if you are a growing person in the faith that Paul wants you to be, uh, that, that Paul, the author of Philippians, uh, wanted his readers and hearers in Philippi, and even down the road, the Holy Spirit that penned these words through Paul, writing to you and trying to reach you, he wants you to be a growing person flourishing in the faith. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father, help us to understand Philippians. Help us to understand, Lord, that this groundwork we're doing is going to help us take every phrase and thought in the epistle and put it back in its, its proper context so that it can have the full force of meaning with us. I pray that in the meantime, we would take our four corners position in this world and that we would be balanced, we would be pure, judged by sunlight, and we would be blameless because a section that starts with thinking and thanking is going to end with progress and praise, revealing the glory of God and thanking Him, attributing to Him the progress that we do have. And all of this uh, fits together and works perfectly without being disassembled or taken apart or fragmented in the work of your Spirit in our life. So bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may this week you live a non-fragmented existence, partially touched by God in all of the four corners of your existence, but fully and completely led by the character and deeds of Jesus himself in Christ's name. Amen. <music>